Welcome in the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world. We are gathered to worship, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to remember before God our sister, Elda LaCrosse, to give thanks for her life, to commend her to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in grief. All who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In her baptism, Elda was clothed with, clothed with Christ, in the day of Christ's coming, she will be clothed in glory. The Lord 
Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He leads me beside quiet waters, he restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray this morning. Almighty God, even in the darkest of times, your love never fails. You can turn the shadow of death into the dawn of eternal life. Help us receive your word with believing and receptive hearts, so that we may both grieve as we miss help and rejoice in her presence with you, your Son and the Spirit. Comfort us as we rest as children in your care. Hear us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to hear the hymn, I Was There to Hear Your Morning Cry.
morning, this evening, afternoon, we have a few portions of scripture we're going to read. The first is from the 103rd Psalm, the first 12 verses. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The, Lord's, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In the 8th chapter of Romans, starting in verse 31 and going to 39. <clears throat> what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the final passage this afternoon is John chapter 14 verses 1 through 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let us hear now amazing grace. Help. 
and she never corrected me. And then yesterday I found out that I was saying it right at first and wrong at second. Uh, she was just too nice to correct me. So uh, your mother is a very wonderful lady. She was at, um, I think every single time I preached, she was there and she was there smiling. I, I don't think I ever saw her look cross when she was there. And uh, nursing homes have their challenges. They, they, you know, living there is not easy. It, it can be a little, you know, it's, it's different than being at home. But uh, I never saw anything but joy on her face. Now, normally when I come and I, I preach a funeral message, I like to look at Matthew and, uh, and see in the parable of Jesus where he, he, he shares about those on the left and those on the right. And, and uh, Jesus looks at the one group and says, and says, well done, good and faithful servant. And normally I like to go there, but I've been drawn lately to the baptism, to looking at like Paul is writing here about baptism, drawn to the ritual that is there in baptism. There's a theology with a little t in baptism, and it points to something that is, it points to reality. It, it, it's a symbol that shows something that is true that Christ has done. It's a symbol that shows something that is real, that is within our life. And the theology of baptism, well, we, we see it. There's a couple of different modes. Uh, we can sprinkle or we can we can dunk the immersion. But when we think of baptism, especially when we look in the Gospels or when we look in the book of Acts, we think of uh, John down by the river baptizing. We think of Jesus going to the river and being baptized there. And we think of the, the, uh, the families that were baptized together in the book of Acts. They were outside. They were very public things. And there is, a, there is something about its mode that catches my attention. The imagery that is there in baptism is that you have a person who is standing. The pastor or whoever it is who is there is standing with them. And as the person stands to be baptized, they're in the water, normally about waist deep. The pastor is there in the water with them. And of course, uh, we often put hands over the nose and, and go down. But the very first thing that happens, well, okay, the second thing, after the Trinitarian formula is given, the next thing that happens is that person goes down under the water. A moment ago, you saw them standing with, with the pastor. But now they are now under the water. You know, it's one of those little things that when I do this, that's always in the back of my head. So I always kind of make sure the water laps over the person. There's nothing... Nothing necessary in that, but it's one of those things in my mind. There's a symbol to this. There's a reason for this. There's a reason why this symbol was chosen. And what happens is the person goes down. A moment ago you saw them, now you don't see them. Paul talks about here that when you are baptized into Christ, you are baptized into his death. Well, the theology points to a promise. A person who goes down in baptism does not stay there. I, I've done a few baptisms, but I've never done a baptism and left the person there in the water. That second part of baptism is crucial. The person goes down in the water, but the promise is that they don't stay there. They come back out of the water. There is a lot of imagery built into it, and one of the images and one of the things that I think is inexorably tied to everything that is taught there can also be seen in the Passover. In the Passover, uh, during that time when, when Moses was going to the Pharaoh and saying, let my people go, and there had been nine plagues, Moses and Aaron had gone there many times and said, let my people go, but the the Pharaoh wasn't about to let them do that. And so the Lord said there will be one plague, it will be the final plague, the plague of the first one. But as that was announced, that judgment was coming, in the midst of judgment, there was also redemption. He told the people, anyone who would listen, and actually, anyone who would listen, go and take the lamb's blood and put it on your door. 
on both sides on the top. Put it there. When the angel comes, the angel will come and they will pass over. They, they won't come to this house. They'll move on. As the people were in that, the angel passed on. I am certain there were Israelites who didn't do it, who suffered. And I'm guessing there were probably Egyptians who did do it. Some families here and there who would have been under the same cover. But it was being under the cover of the matter. This imagery all ties together into something that is a great and precious promise to us. I was thinking, I thought often actually, in the first church that I pastored, it was out in eastern Iowa, and Iowa is just corn territory. There's corn everywhere. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of combines that are always taking out corn. Not quite now, but late October, early November, they'll be out there taking down corn. I had a person who was a, a member of my church, a friend of mine, who told me that he gets nervous every time he sees the combines. And I, I thought that was odd. And I said, what do you mean you get nervous when you see the combines? He said, I know that the farmer who is farming there wants every kernel in the hopper. They, they want every kernel to go up into the hopper. But I know that when the, when the chaff is being thrown out the back, I've walked in the fields after that, and I've seen that there's been kernels on the ground. And he said, I'm afraid, Dave, that, that uh, you know, it's going to come to my time, and even though the Lord is coming to harvest, that I'll be one of those little kernels that is missed. And uh, as, he, as he said this to me, I just couldn't think, like, oh man, let me tell you about who God is. Let me tell you about this. So that promise that is given here, let me tell you about the promise that is in Christ, that this promise that if you are in Him and you are sealed in Him and you belong to Him, He's not going to let you go. There is a promise in baptism that we have in Christ through assurance of life with Him as we are redeemed and under His blood and living in fellowship with Him. We read earlier a passage that that uh, had been requested, Romans chapter eight, and it catches my attention even in Romans chapter eight, starting in verse thirty-four. Who is he that condemns? And Paul answers the question. Christ Jesus. Well, he doesn't answer the question. He just tells us the truth. Christ Jesus, who died, who more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So, what does it matter if we are, really, if you get down to it, what does it matter if you are accused? Because as you are being accused, the one who stands there interceding at God's right hand all the time is this same Jesus. But he keeps going, and he says in verse 38, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. It all points to the promise that we have in Christ, that as we are in Christ and as we belong to Him, there is no way that we are beyond His seal of redemption. If we are in Him, well, just as surely as the person who is being baptized does not stay down in the water, just as surely as that, they will rise. It's not because of us. It's not because of anything great that we do. It's because of who he is. I saw a, a very impressive um, video a few days ago. And this impressive video, I've seen, I've seen models before. And there's a town in Iowa that's very, very proud of the trains that go through there. And if you go to that town, there's a, there's a model railroading club that, that has an exquisite model there. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing. And I saw a video of a model that was made of ships, of the, uh, the Ark Royal, uh, a British aircraft carrier, and it was amazing. The thing is, with models that have been built by the hands of human beings, 
as you get closer to them, as you look and you see them, you start seeing, yes, this is a model. I can see the imperfection here, I can see the imperfection here. Even if it was made by the hand of a master, the closer you look, the more you will see that there are imperfections there. But I want you to consider the hand of our God. There was many times that I've looked at just the most simple of creatures that God has created. Just a cricket. A simple creature that he has made. And as I pick up this creature and look at it, and I see the details that he has etched in this thing, the closer I look at it, the more I see of nothing but perfection. Of a simple creature, he's made millions of them just in our town. That is the power of our God. If we are in him, we belong to him. We have confessed, we have repented, we have turned to him. If we are in him, there is no chance of us being lost through the back with the chaff. I want to assure you this morning, your grandmother walked with God. Is the promise that we read this morning, the baptismal promise. Your, your mother, your grandmother, she was, she was buried with Christ. We know the certainty of her redemption. Not because of Ella, but because of Jesus. Let us pray this morning. Our Holy Father, we thank you for the, we thank you, Father, for the hope that is in that is in you, Father. The hope that is in your Son, Lord. You are we are you are you are our redemption. Father, as we are in you, Lord, we know that there is nothing to nothing to fret about, nothing to worry about. Lord, uh, let us be found in you always, Lord. Father, I just ask today that you be glorified, you be lifted up. And today is as we as memories come, as beautiful memories come, as smiles come, and then as tears come with those smiles, Father, I ask that the reminiscence, Lord, of, of who you are, Lord, I ask that a reminder of who you are come to us as well. Lord, you are King of kings, Lord of lords. There is none like you. And no matter the power that comes against, nothing can change who you are or what you have done. Now let us pray as our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now this morning, uh, there's going to be a song that's played that uh, is Wind Beneath My Wings. It was sung by Holly and Jerry, and accompaniment on the piano by Kim and Lisa.
receive now this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor 